Materials research is making better materials. Materials that are smaller, stronger, faster, smarter, and more to advance our understanding of the world around us and improve lives everywhere. With almost 14,000 members, the Materials Research Society is the organization that brings them all together. From students to Nobel laureates, to collaborate, share research, and change the world. Now in Boston, Massachusetts, it's time for the 2019 MRS Fall Meeting and Exhibit. And we're MRS TV. Here we are again. It's day four here at the MRS 2019 Fall Meeting and Exhibit. We've tackled nanomaterials. We've taken on quantum technology and lots more besides. It's our final show here in Boston, but we've saved some of the best for last. Today, we'll hear from the winner of the prestigious Von Hippel Award, as well as discuss MRS's efforts to build diversity in materials research. Let's take a closer look at what's coming up. So there's a long history in the field of uh, metal materials mm -hmm. where people have kind of seen this before, uh, but we were able to develop methods to make these things reproducibly and high yield, and we do a lot of biological applications with them. The picture of a bright future cannot be realized with only scientists and engineers, that we really have to bring the society at large to come work together with us. Like a lot of scientists, you know, if left to myself, I'll just work on my science, and I kind of ignore all the administrative stuff. Right, right. But being on the board of MRS, you're forced to engage with both the strategic issues of an organization and the people issues. First up, let's hear from last night's 2019 MRS David Turnbull Lecture, where Paula T. Hammond discussed her important work in self-assembled macromolecular systems. Thank you. I'm excited to talk to you today about how we can design particles that have an attraction that causes them to stick to specific cells or tissues. This is one of the things that we do in our lab, and we're excited because we can use electrostatic interactions in combination with secondary interactions to do just that. I called my presentation Sticky Nanoparticles for Better Medicine. And the reason for that is that we're designing these nanoparticles or carriers that have charged groups on their outside. And they also have other groups which allow these nanoparticles to attach to specific cells or tissues and to remain there so that they can deliver their payload of drug. Uh, we're using this as a way uh, to really recognize the fact that we can use these nonspecific interactions as a way to target drugs to specific parts of the body. Right now we're developing a range of different material systems that can give a very controlled release of drugs in a sequential fashion. We can do this in the form of thin films and in nanoparticle form. So right now we're hoping that these thin film release systems can be applied for wound healing to help address the healing of wounds in a very controlled fashion, and also for regenerative medicine to help regenerate bone and other tissues at uh, the point of an implant, such as an orthopedic implant. On the other hand, our nanoparticles are being targeted toward cancer, infectious disease, and osteoarthritis. Polymers have always been fascinating to me because when I took a class uh, back when I was an undergraduate on polymer science, I learned that we can modify simple little things on this large macromolecular chain and get extremely different properties that range from rubbery materials to very dense ones to clear ones. Uh, that got me really excited about polymer science. And as I began to explore the field more, I began to recognize that I could use my chemical tool set to actually modify what these polymers can do. That led me to work with polymers that can assemble together to create an interesting material or structure. And ultimately, I began to get involved in the use of layer by layer approaches in which we layer positively and negatively charged polymers together and create functional materials that can combine the properties of these different material systems. I am extremely excited to win the David A. Turnbull Lectureship Award. To me, it means a huge amount because of the fantastic people who have been awarded it in the past. I'm also excited because there haven't been many women who have received it. And I think that there are so many things that women scientists and engineers are doing 
this award really uh, recognizes that fact. Exciting work. Paula Hammond there using materials to provide new options to fight cancer. Now with more on nanomedicine, let's go to Japan to look at the work of scientists to develop in-body hospitals using nanomachines. It's the Innovation Center of Nanomedicine, or ICOM. The Innovation Center of Nanomedicine, uh, called ICOM in short, launched in 2015 under the operation of Kawasaki Institute of Industrial Promotion to facilitate the research connecting nanotechnology and medicine. As you know, uh, especially in Japan, we are now in an aging society. So uh, there is, of course, a prolongation of the uh, lifespan. But unfortunately, uh, many of them are not always in a healthy condition. So we would like to make uh, these people to live in a very healthy condition by the invention of the system uh, named uh, in-body hospitals. To realize the in-body hospitals, uh, we need uh, tiny medical instruments which can always circulate in their body and autonomously carrying out uh, detection, diagnosis, and therapy. So uh, these uh, tiny uh, medical instruments are named nanomachines. We are aiming for the life with in-body hospital in which we inject nanocapsules that circulating uh, in, in our body and detect diseases in early stage, eventually the nanocapsule can prevent all diseases. So if you have one in the future, um, you can spend the time uh, without concerning about any diseases. It's going to be a long journey. However, we believe in body hospital is not dream at all because we have a core technology. We need many things to complete in body hospital such as smart researchers, huge capitals, cutting edge technologies. In order to integrate these elements here, we're going to launch startup incubation system. We already established uh, three startup companies and these companies are succeeded to raise over 15 million dollars already. Brazil Therapeutics is developing the technology for the crossing the blood-brain barrier to deliver the drug to the brain. Brain does not allow to any molecule unnecessarily to the brain. It makes it difficult to the developing the medicine for the serious disease. We have the solution of that. Our company's vision is we would like to be leading a company to deliver the drug to the brain. We always say we would like to be the company like Intel in CNS field. As you know, any computer has an Intel platform. It's the same, you know, the story we have. The CNS disease drug has our technology in their, you know, products. For example, most of the medicine which uh, launch from the pharmaceutical company in the worldwide employee plays on technology to deliver that drug to the brain. It is a very, very uh, fantastic dream for us. We would like to be the global company. That is our vision. So ICOM has a vision uh, which we aim to be the hub of the healthcare research complex in a global standard. The research team are from many different countries, so very big diversity. And they are, of course, very good in the research, but uh, we implement them with very strong entrepreneurial SIPs. We are doing here uh, cutting edge research using uh, state of the art instrumentation such as in vivo confocal microscopy.
for pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics of drug delivery systems in living animals. We are housing mice and rats, including various kinds of disease models, like tumor cell transplantation, transgenic mice which develop Alzheimer dementia, or surgical models of spinal cord injury, and so on. We have several commun communal devices like NMO, micro CT, two photon high speed confocal in vivo microscope, and IBIS, which we can observe accumulation of emitting or fluorescent dye to target cells like cancer cells in living animals. Innovation Center of Nanomedicine is a global site for the nanomedicine in the worldwide. Most of the worldwide researchers came to here and have a discussion with anybody in this you know, facility. That is also the very, very good uh, chance for us to expand the network. This institute is uh, originally built upon the concept of under the one roof, where we have biochemical room, animal facility, administrative office, and even the director office in the same building where we don't need to go anywhere to do our research and also to discuss with the administrative staff. Our institute is opposite side of Tokyo International Airport. And now bridge is under construction. So uh, within next year, we will be connected directly by this bridge, which of course have a very strong connection with overseas communities, which makes this institute very global and we are ready to be a world-reading innovation hub. Today we're joined by Dr. Jaime Zhang and Dr. Catherine Murphy. Good to see you both. Thanks for spending some time with us. Also a big congratulations as well on having won the 2019 MRS Medal Award. Now your shared citation reads for outstanding contributions on the study of anisotropic nanoscale materials, transformation and application. I want you both to tell me a little bit about the work that led to this award. Catherine, we'll start with you. Sure. Well, uh, when we say anisotropic, we mean something that is not a sphere in terms of shape. Okay. So uh, lo long ago, about uh, 1999, 2000 or so, in my group we developed ways uh, to make little bits of metal uh, in colloidal solution where the final particle shape is uh, rods. And you can change the size of the rod, the, some of the details of the rod performance. And what this means is we have uh, different optical properties as a function of particle shape. So there's a long history in the field of uh, metal materials mm. where people have kind of seen this before, uh, but we were able to develop methods to make these things reproducibly and high yield, and we do a lot of biological applications with them. Now, Jaime, your work is very similar to that, but what do you focus on? So my focus mostly on the imaging. Uh, okay. Previously, all the uh, studies is the uh, stop the reaction and, and see what had happened, trying to put together uh, the, the, how the materials form. And we developed method to directly observe the dynamic pr processes of the formation. So we can image using transmission electron microscopy to look at single particle uh, formation, the nano rod form, for example, by nanoparticle attached together. Now what interested you first in getting into this field within material science? It's really, uh, the nanoscience is a very fantastic um, uh, world. I, uh, I'm very uh, fascinated by a lot of uh, nanoscale materials, interesting properties and applications. And again, that um, most of the study is the post-processing, and uh, I've been well trained in both materials processing and electron microscopy, and it's natural for me trying to put this together so we can study this um, directly by imaging. Sure. Uh, plus, I'm in uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. We have fantastic electron microscopy facilities. That doesn't hurt either. Now, Catherine, mm -hmm. what drew you into the field? So uh, we were very interested in making objects that were the size of viruses. 
but were not actual viruses. So, uh, so it turns out these little metal particles, you can grow them in the size of these biological entities, and then we can also functionalize our surface chemistry. So I like shapes, I like colors, and it turns out every different particle shape has a different color. So for me, it was a perfect you know, marriage of art and science. <laughs> That's great. Now, you each presented talks at the awards recipients forum. Catherine, you presented a talk, A Golden Time for Nanotechnology. Tell me a little bit about what you spoke on. Sure, so since the metal particles we work with are mostly gold, uh, that's where the golden time comes from. Um, and also, it turns out there's just more and more uh, work in the area, and so people are getting good at making all kinds of different sizes and shapes of gold particles. And again, that leads to all different kinds of optical-based applications, and also some more plasmatic uh, type applications. So the field, the synthesis part is getting, is, is enormous, and now the applications are starting to bloom up. So I think it's a very good time, right? I think uh, so. To, to be in the area. Now, Jaime, you presented real-time imaging of nanoscale materials, transformations in liquids. So what did you speak in your presentation? What did you talk about? And I briefly introduced uh, the complexity and also beauty of these nanoscale materials transformations. And uh, we have a very unique technique to uh, directly image the dynamic processes. I gave uh, a couple of examples. I especially highlighted one of amazing undergraduate students made contribution mm -hmm. in this area. I hope can, it can inspire young graduate students to join in this exciting research. I'm sure it will, absolutely. So once you get back to your labs, the meeting's over, where does your work lead to from here? Well, there's a lot of exciting things yeah. to do for us. Um, in terms of imaging, and there's a, a very uh, fast growth and uh, technology, very e exciting. Um, for example, we can do much more in uh, doing fast imaging, much faster, and to vary the temperature, and uh, higher resolution, better control of electron beam effects, and uh, there are many different systems we can work on. Um, you have a lot of work ahead. It's a lot of work. <laughs> Catherine, same question for you. What's next? Uh, well, we are infinite in all directions. Uh, we do fundamental synthesis stuff, which now we're uh, going to different metals besides gold and making biometallic structures. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also doing a lot more with the surface chemistry. So Jaime has been focused on uh, watching particles grow, you know, almost at, with atomic resolution in a liquid at real time. We're interested in the soft stuff. There's all these additives we have in the pot to help control the growth of these little crystals. And so we're, we can't do it as fast as Jaime, but we can do some sort of stop measure experiments to look at the organic-y stuff on the surface at different points during the growth, which will help us figure out the mechanism, which is very fun. And then we also have a lot of biological things we do, getting into uh, sort of some sensing, some diagnostics, and even some uh, delivery type mechanisms for like drug delivery type stuff. And also even some ecological work we do uh, with collaborators to see where do these particles go in an ecosystem and what impact does that have? Well, you have me excited. You need to get back to work as soon as possible. <laughs> Catherine Jaime, thanks for your time. Great to meet you. Thanks, Thank Chris. You. We're speaking today to Karen Lozano. Karen, great to meet you, and thanks for spending some time with us. Likewise. So we're celebrating 15 years of the Partnerships for Research and Education in Materials, or PREM, the programs at this meeting. Let's start talking about PREM, first of all. What is it, and how are you related to it? What's your role? Okay, uh, first of all, good morning. Good morning. And uh, PREM is, uh, a partnership with uh, DMR sponsor centers, Division of Materials Research from National Science Foundation. And uh, the centers are like the MRSEC, which are the Materials Research Science and Engineering Center, or STC, or National Labs. So all of these mega stars in material science, they partner with uh, minority institutions to try to facilitate access to high-tech equipment, uh, motivate students, uh, underrepresented students, 
that they go and spend summers with them. There's these partnerships between faculty and uh, exchange of students from the faculty during the sem uh, academic semesters, fall or spring, and uh, basically to kind of help push this platform of research in material science for the minority institutions. Now, how are you connected to it? I am the director of the program at uh, UTRGV. It's, uh, we're you know, based at UTRGV, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, and we're partnering with uh, MERSEC at the University of Minnesota. Okay. Now, there are a number of PREM students here at this meeting. In fact, you said you brought 64? Yes. So what will they be doing while they're here? That's a large group. Uh, yes, it's basically between four and five students per PREM. There okay. are 15 PREMs in the nation. And um, we're bringing them to get to know each other, to network, to discuss future opportunities, and also for them to um, participate in different activities we don't want to bring them all and then place them in a room for the whole conference, right? We want them to experience the conference. So it's a strategically where they have like a breakfast in the morning, a talk, and then they have the whole day free to experience the conference. Gotcha. And then they have poster session in the afternoon. They're in our labs and they're very excited and motivated by the faculty that works with them and the experience that they have had with the partner institution. But they haven't experienced something like this. So when they come here, it's like, okay, I want to do graduate school in material science. Right. And that's the purpose of... It's uh, a great motivator. A huge motivator. Now, you just brought up the poster session. So what are some of the outcomes that you're looking for as a result of that session? So we want them to experience uh, basically seeing what everybody else is doing and basically value, I guess, the importance of what they're doing. Sometimes um, they think they have a project at a small institution or... Um, at a minority institution and, and it's a project that they don't really n exactly know how important it is or they don't value the importance of it. Yeah. So once they come and see everybody else and they also get ideas, right? So they go and look at everybody else's poster and they're like, oh, they're using this equipment that it might be useful for what I'm doing and they start networking with other students. Program's 15 years old. Yes. So tell me about some PREM success stories. We have, for example, 100% retention and graduation in uh, the students that participate in that's the projects. Fantastic. And that's, that's fantastic. And um, it's because of the motivation that high tech projects bring to students. They realize that what they're doing, what they're learning is important and they can do something with it. And the exchange of ideas that they have with other students, they feel that connection many times. Yeah. Our students, it's not that, that they're not capable of moving forward. It's sometimes the isolation that, you know, research brings or the isolation that studying a certain degree might bring. So this is like a whole family that supports the success of everybody, not just from my institution, but as a family. And quickly, if someone out there is listening and wants more information, wants to get involved with PREM, where can they go? The National Science Foundation has the website and then they have the, the lines for applying for the next PREM cycle. It's always on the website. Very good. Karen Lozano, thank you for your time. Great talking to you. Thank you. Joining us now is Dr. Shirley Mung. Shirley, great to see you. Hello. Also, congratulations on having been named as the Editor-in-Chief of MRS Energy and Sustainability. So let's start with that journal itself. It's been around since 2014. What is MRS Energy and Sustainability all about? MRS is a society um, that really takes a great interest in how those materials development have an impact on the sustainability of the planet. Very beginning, the journal is to promote all the wonderful content that have been presented in our MRS conferences. And in fact, the journal is unique in the MRS portfolio in that its intended audience is, of course, materials researchers, but it also has a sociological and political aspect. So what is the importance of this broadly interdisciplinary approach? We really want to emphasize that uh, uh, science, technology, particularly in the field of uh, energy technologies, really need to have a deep connection with the society because ultimately what we do at the fundamental science level and apply the research level uh, should reach out to the public and have an 
impact on our society. So uh, the journal is very uniquely to position ourselves to be a platform where uh, people outside of the MRS community learn what we are doing, and then we reach out to social scientists, economists, the policy makers uh, to help them make uh, uh, rational decisions sure. regarding the sustainability issues. So in addition to your role as editor-in-chief, you're also a professor of nanoengineering and materials research at the University of California, San Diego. I want you to tell me more about your background and how you came to be interested in energy and sustainability aspects of your research. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, trained as a material scientist at MIT uh, and working on energy storage materials, aka battery materials. Right. Yeah, so my research uh, when I was a PhD student was really working on how to replace the component in your battery is called cobalt, which is a very unsustainable material. Uh -huh. There's limited okay. supplies. So I was working on replacing that with more abundant metals such like manganese and nickel. So that got me started in materials research. And uh, the fact is that most of today's um, lithium-ion batteries uh, in the electric vehicle, they use only you know, 10 or 15 percent of the cobalt. Uh, majority of it is uh, abundant elements like nickel and aluminum oh, or okay. manganese. So we're already kind of transitioning over. Yes, in the last uh, 15 years. And what drew you at first to energy and sustainability? Uh, I believe that uh, this is actually our generation scientist responsibility that yeah. we need to find the solutions for tackle the climate change uh, because of the intermittencies of uh, wind and the solar. Uh, without the batteries, those renewable sources cannot be deployed. Uh, you have to store the energy somewhere. Exactly, right? yeah. So batteries is a key enabler uh, for the renewable sources. Mm. And, uh, you know, for my current uh, research group, we have a group of uh, 40 scientists in my group, uh, students and postdocs, uh, working tirelessly on uh, enabling large grid storage, enable batteries that has very high energy density but never catch fires, and enable batteries that uh, possibly can last for 30 years instead of just three years. Right. Yeah, so there are a lot of uh, very, very fascinating uh, material science related problems and uh, challenges to be resolved. So I'm really like, I think I picked a good career. I think you did as well. Very exciting. And just quickly, tell me about the future for the journal. Where do you see it going in, in the near future? So I, uh, my vision for the MRS Energy and Sustainability is really we want to be the number one journal for materials, uh, energy materials research that uh, showcase the convergent research among science, technology, social science, economics, and the policy. The picture of a bright future cannot be realized with only scientists and engineers, that we really have to bring the society at large to come work together with us to you know, bring our work to impact the society in a much more agile fashion. That is a great vision. Dr. Shirley Mung, thanks for your time. My pleasure. I can't wait to take a closer look at that journal. Great work from the team behind MRS Energy and Sustainability. Now looking at nuclear energy, let's go to Idaho National Lab, where researchers are working to develop, test, and qualify new fuels and materials. Idaho National Laboratory was formed in 1949 as a National Reactor Testing Station. And it was here where Enrico Fermi's dream was realized and the first production of electricity from nuclear power occurred. Since that time, we've built 52 reactors on this site and established much of the design basis, not only for the current commercial reactor fleet, but for many advanced reactor designs. IMCL houses the same types of state-of-the-art equipment that you normally find at a top-tier university or a uh, large industry innovation center. These tools and IMCL itself are configured specifically to handle high-activity radioactive materials to allow the characterization of these advanced materials. Most importantly, as a user facility, IMCL 
makes these tools accessible to materials, to nuclear researchers from around the nation and around the world. So the main mission of the Irradiated Materials Characterization Lab is to answer the question of why certain processes are happening within our nuclear materials. And we want to then couple those things that we find with the engineering scale changes within the material so we can readily answer the question as what things happen and why they happen. The importance of doing this work is really to develop a safer, better, more efficient nuclear system. And that all starts with the materials that you use for these systems. If we can really dive into why certain processes are happening within these fuels and, and materials, then we can seek to develop better, safer, more reliable materials to build more efficient nuclear reactors. INL has extensive nuclear fuels and materials research and development programs. We first test our nuclear fuels and steady state reactors to better understand the steady state performance and then also in transient reactors to understand failure mechanisms. We first characterize the, uh, the fuels when they come out of the reactor on an engineering scale to determine critical performance parameters and if it failed to determine the failure mechanism. The process starts when we manufacture a nuclear fuel here or bring fuel in from somewhere else. We then insert it in one of our reactors for irradiation testing. After irradiation, we bring it into the materials and fuels complex to characterize the fuel, first with non-destructive testing, then destructive testing, to understand both engineering scale and microstructural all the way down to atomistic effects. Transmission electron microscope is an instrument allowing analysis, visualization of a small sample from micro scale to atomic scale. Transmission electron microscope allows us to study crystal structure, defects, grain orientation, chemical composition of phases in the material through electron diffraction, X-ray, electron energy analysis. Idaho National Lab has one of the best transmission electron microscope in the world. It's very unique and it's very productive. So the work that we're doing for thermal properties actually comes in two different categories. Uh, we do thermodynamic properties and we do thermal transport properties. Thermodynamic properties are things like heat capacity and uh, heat associated with microstructural changes in the material. Thermal transport properties are the efficient way that materials can move heat. And it's important because that is the property that determines how well a fuel performs in a reactor. And um, the design of new reactors and new fuels is based on that. What's unique about that is now we have the ability to measure thermal conductivity radially across the material, which is useful for how heat flows actually in the reactor. Um, the third instrument that we have in IMCL is a thermogravimetric differential thermal scanning analyzer with a gas mass spec on it. It does thermodynamic properties and retained fission gas products. At INL we see a bright future for nuclear energy as a, uh, a reliable, clean energy source that the world needs. So we'll keep investing in capabilities and infrastructure to allow nuclear development to happen in collaboration with researchers from around the country and around the world. Joining us now is the 2019 MRS Von Hippel Award winner. My pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jerry Tursoff. Dr. Tursoff, thanks for spending some time with us. And congratulations, by the way. Your citation reads, for advancing the understanding of low dimensional and nanoscale electronic materials, surfaces and interfaces through elegant theoretical models that highlight the essential physics controlling growth, structure, and electronic properties. I want you to tell us a little bit about your work and how you came to be interested in that particular field. So as you might guess from this citation, it's really not just one field. So in my career, I've worked in a number of kind of different areas and, I, and that was written to try to cover those. So I think if there's a unifying thread through all my work, it's basically 
that there are a lot of problems that come up that are too complicated to really solve properly. And so I try to make simple models that let you at least get some insight into the problem. That's always how I thought of physics as being because that's how it is in textbooks. But it's been wonderful for me that I've been able to make a career doing that sort of thing. Sure. What are some applications or devices that have resulted from the work in your field? It's been sort of the other way around. Um, there will be an application that makes people work on some materials set and then that throws up problems and then those problems interest me. So for example, the first thing I worked on was Schottky barriers, which are a classic problem for a lot of electronic devices. You have a metal and a semiconductor and the interface has an electronic barrier. There was, there was a lot of phenomenology understood, but not a unifying idea. And I started out trying to do a real calculation and found out it was just too hard. So I uh, started thinking, well, you know, what, what's a simple picture that explains it? And I was actually able to come up with an idea to capture sort of the essence of why you always have this barrier. And it's very simplistic, but I think it's been very useful because it changed how people think about the problem. And that's interesting and fantastic. By the way, your award talk is titled Simple Models for Complex Behavior in Nanowire Growth. What are some of the key points from your talk there? People have studied nanowires for quite a while now because they have a lot of potential applications. And for most of those applications, you want wires that just grow simply straight up from the surface. And that's been pretty well understood for quite a while. But often people see more complicated behavior and nobody had a way of modeling that more complicated behavior because it's not feasible to do a really realistic calculation. So my collaborators and I were able to come up with a very simple model that you could, you, you could play around with it on the computer. I like to play around. Right. But, um, but still it could capture a lot of the complexity of these real systems. And one of the highlights was that we were able to actually predict some complex growth modes and then see them in experiment. Ah, okay. Now you've been a long-standing member with MRS. How has engaging with MRS been a positive factor in your career? Like a lot of scientists, you know, if left to myself, I'll just work on my science and I kind of ignore all the administrative stuff. Right, right. But being on the board of MRS, you're forced to engage with both the strategic issues of an organization and the people issues, and also just what it takes day to day to keep things running. And you meet some remarkable people because on the board there were some people like me with very little experience and that sort of thing, but there were other people with um, tremendous experience and knowledge that I was able to learn a lot from. So that was a wonderful experience. Dr. Jerry Tursoff, again, congratulations, 2019 MRS Von Hippel Award winner. Great speaking with you. Thank you. Now from semiconductors to ceramics, it's time to visit the Center for Advanced Ceramic Technology at Alfred University. Researchers there are developing the essential materials behind everything from cell phones to medical devices. The Center for Advanced Ceramic Technology is an Empire State Development, NYSTAR funded uh, unit within the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University. All of those NYSTAR funded units goal is to speed up technology transfer from universities and academic research into the marketplace in order to enhance New York State economic development. Our Center for Advanced Ceramic Technology focuses on Alfred University and the New York State College of Ceramics core strengths in ceramic and glass technologies and science. Specifically, our focus areas and expertise of our faculty and researchers is on characterization of materials and processing of those materials and the fundamental research behind ceramic and glass technologies. Our labs are uniquely equipped to characterize materials from powders, starting with powder characterization, up through processing and forming, into sintering and densification, and final properties after creating a sintered and densified part, such as physical and mechanical properties, even to extremely high temperatures. Here at the Center for Advanced Ceramic Technology, we've worked on all materials, 
ranging from traditional ceramics such as porcelains, which are industrially important, to advanced ceramics such as silicon carbide for armor applications, zirconia for hip replacement joints, and other materials such as biomaterials and electronic materials here at Alfred. Sometimes when you're working with a client, you're not sure what the next test will need to be, and having all the equipment available for us to do the testing streamlines that process. So if I need to do a new test, if I was somewhere else, I'd have to go find that test to get it done. Here, I can do it in-house. Here in the CAT at Alfred University, we have two suites of instrumentation. We have the high temperature materials characterization tools, and then we also have high temperature materials properties measurement capability. And, and we team those together. When we team those two together, we're able to look at fundamentally how to invent, develop new materials, but we also can learn in a really efficient way how to manufacture those materials or how to scale them up. So x-ray diffraction or even more generally x-ray scattering is used to tell how atoms fit together in materials and so with that knowledge of how atoms fit together we can do two things. We can figure out why materials work the way they do and then we can also figure out how to make them. Spectrometers are a little different. They allow us to look at a very local scale of atom to atom and so that allows us to do something really interesting which is to look at glasses as well as ceramics. And so we have a really long history here in Alfred in glass science and studies of glass. We can do these experiments at high temperature. We can do them under controlled gas atmosphere. We can do them with controlled electric field, magnetic field, etc. Our Center for Advanced Ceramic Technology here at Alfred University is really a conduit for our students and our faculty and our research staff to be able to partner very directly with industry to help them with their research needs. Sex and glass technologies chemically strengthens glass products. The primary product that we produce is the chemically strengthened glass cartridge in EpiPens. The other business products are centrifuge tubes, chemically strengthened to take high spins, and flat glass covers, uh, which can go into the cell phone devices. We have used Alfred University's high energy electron beam equipment, the x-ray equipment, the mechanical testing equipment, and optical biofringence equipment to control the quality of the product that goes out of here. Foster Rush is a consulting company that specializes in electronics, nanotechnology, and clean tech. We also are involved in the design and manufacturing of custom process and test equipment. The ceramic materials that we're working with are dielectric and piezoelectric materials as well as low temperature co-fired ceramics. The advantages of an industry academic partnership like CACT is our ability to access state-of-the-art manufacturing equipment and the expertise of faculty at a very reasonable cost without the capital expenditure that we would incur as a small company. In addition, we have exposure to students that could potentially be employees of not only our own company, but also our customers. The future is very exciting in the space of ceramics, glass, and engineering in general. Of course, computer and data analytics are becoming a huge part of that space as well. So understanding material informatics and how those can form our research in the ceramics and material science space will be a huge part of the future direction uh, that the industry will be going and that our students need to be equipped as they enter the workforce. Today we're speaking to 2019 MRS Fall Meeting Chair, Professor Brian Huey. Professor Huey, good to see you. Good morning. Now, we're partway through this meeting. and something you've been working on for several years now, this meeting. How has it been going as far as you're concerned? And what have been some of the highlights? We began with a blizzard, so that was very exciting. <laughs> was that a highlight or a low light? Well, I, I think really there is a highlight connected to that. I think it forced people to stay in house. I think we've actually seen more interactions amongst the attendees because it's hard to walk outside. Uh, yeah, we have, you have to, a captive audience. We, I, I didn't want to say it that way. <laughs> but I think the real focus here is the content. Yeah. Uh, you know, this year we have symposia clustered in in some new areas. Uh, we have a, a dramatic rise in the number of talks on, on the topics of energy, 
Uh, we have an entire cluster devoted to quantum materials and, and quantum computing. We've combined, I think, for the first time, characterization and data science. So those are things that are very naturally going together uh, in industry and in academia, and so it made sense for us to co-locate those talks as best as we could so that those audiences that are otherwise often not talking to each other actually are interacting with each other directly. In springboarding off those topics you mentioned, there have been particularly strong schedules of broader impact events at this meeting. Are there particular broader impact events that stand out in your mind? Absolutely. Well, you know, the meeting is full of broader impact opportunities for students, for faculty, for, for other researchers in, in, in industry and in academia else, elsewhere. One of the symposia that really is focused on broader impacts um, is the first time that we've seen at, the, at this organization a combination of data science and education. Uh, increasingly in the U.S. and abroad, those, there, there are departments that are focusing on this, uh, not just with classes, but entire programs or, or even degrees in, those, in that topic of data science. And so it's, it's important for our community to, to figure out best practices and how to educate along those lines. But we also have, for the first time, a program for future faculty members. Mm -hmm. Future faculty members are interacting very directly with departments that are hiring. So that's a new experiment, and we'll yeah. see how that goes. But, but that seems like a very promising opportunity for those who are um, working towards that next step in their career. Now, we mentioned that your efforts as meeting chair began several years ago. Take us through that journey, and what are some of the things that you've discovered along the way? Sure. I, you know, I was personally very fortunate. I got to interview to be an astronaut many years ago, and I think the call for running this symposium is a little bit similar to being, being welcomed to that, that, uh, that interview process, because you're, a, you're basically volunteering to be flung out into space, honestly. That's rarefied <laughs> air. There aren't a lot of people that can say that. It's, it was a fortunate experience. So, you know, you're really not quite understanding exactly what you volunteered for, but yeah. it is a really great ride, honestly. The meetings themselves have run for many years. They have a great history uh, than of great success, uh, the organization has more agility, and you know, we're seeing that with the new topics that are showing up at the conference. But also we have traditional fields like metallurgy and, and atom manufacturing as a new version of that. That's something that is really returning to the roots of what material scientists have done all along. Volunteering as a chair for MRS is a big time commitment. Why did you decide to do something that significant? I think that the key here is that throughout this organization, amongst my five co-chairs, amongst all of the symposium organizers, we're all committed to seeing this organization continue to grow and to see our community grow. The MRS is, in terms of organization of a meeting, is, is a commitment that just feels very natural, I think, certainly to the five of us who are running this meeting and who have run the previous ones and the next ones. Now, we always ask this question, what do you wish someone had told you before you became a meeting chair, and do you have any advice for those maybe coming up after you? The MRS staff and the organization are absolutely wonderful, and they know what they're doing, even when you feel like you don't. Uh, and, and the real point is that this meeting is about the attendees and the quality of the meeting. And so as long as we keep focused on that, then, then fortunately the machine of the, of the organization helps that along. Professor Brian Huey, thanks for your time. Thank you. Enjoy the rest. Absolutely. we finally come to the end of our time here at the 2019 MRS Fall Meeting and Exhibit as we finish up our fourth show here on MRS TV. Now as we all head home for the holiday season with notebooks full of the very cutting edge and material science, make sure you catch everything we have to offer here on MRS TV. Find everything we did here in Boston online on the Fall Meeting website and on YouTube. We'll see you in 2020 at the Spring Meeting in Phoenix. Till then, keep working hard and changing the world. The Materials Research Society welcomes these five new university chapters. That brings our chapter count to 131 from 27 countries. If you are a student or faculty member at a university anywhere in the world and are interested in starting a chapter at your institution, 
visit the University Chapter website, mrs.org slash university chapters, to learn more. MRS offers discounted memberships for those working or studying in developing countries. These memberships are funded by the Materials Research Society Foundation. Visit the MRS website at mrs.org to learn more. The MRS On Demand webinar series is your opportunity to engage with experts on cutting-edge topics in materials research and career advancement. Each webinar features presentations from, in real-time interaction with, leaders in their fields, and attendance is free. Visit mrs.org slash webinars for a listing of upcoming dates and topics. Don't miss this special two-part Thursday evening event, MRS Frontiers Reception, Building Communities, featuring PowerPoint Karaoke. First at 5.30, stop by Constitution B in the Sheridan for PowerPoint Karaoke. It's a fun and entertaining improvisational event you won't want to miss. Then at 7, move next door to Constitution A for the Frontiers Reception. Grab a beverage, enjoy a few hors d'oeuvres, and join the conversation as we explore ways to best build new materials communities around hot topic areas such as artificial intelligence, emerging biomaterials, quantum materials and technologies, responsive and adaptive materials, sustainability, and more. It's sure to be a spirited and thought-provoking evening. Organizing a conference but need a little help? The MRS Conference Services team will apply the same experience, passion, and skills that go into planning the MRS Fall and Spring meetings to your meeting, because the experience matters. Contact Pat Hastings, Director of Meeting Activities, to discuss your specific meeting needs. Since 1990, the MRS Spring Meeting has been held in only two locations, San Francisco and Phoenix, and has always been tied to Easter weekend. All of that changes in 2021 when the MRS Spring Meeting goes on the road. Seattle, Honolulu, and San Francisco have been selected because they are considered Tier 1 locations for meetings and conferences. They are diverse metropolitan areas, premier destinations for arts and entertainment, and because rotations will foster regional and student attendance and allow maximum flexibility for meeting content differentiation. In the meantime, don't miss the 2020 MRS Spring Meeting in Phoenix. We hope you'll join us.